Welcome, everyone. And thanks for joining us for this next installment of Listen Into Conversations That Matter as part of the Larger Story Essential webinar series with Dr. Larry Crabb. I'm Kep Crabb, Larry's oldest son, and I'm founder of LargerStory.com. Always encourage you to check us out online. Um, for today's session of this uh, Listen Into Conversations, we're going we're gonna to do something that's a little bit different, and I'm super excited about this. Uh, it was last Father's Day. Um, as we had all of our family together, and Dad first introduced what he's going to be chatting with you guys today about. Um, and it really has captured me in a way that I'm super excited for you all to hear what's going on. It's also part of Larry's next book that he's almost done writing at this point. And, um, and so we're excited to, to offer this today. Without any further ado, Dad, let me give it to you here, because uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Larry. Yeah. It's been on my mind for some time. I want to invite you all to, uh, to join me in a conversation about a question that has haunted me for probably three decades. And it's a question that I've really never been able to answer. It's bothered me, it's bugged me, but it's a question that I think is very important. It has a lot to do with the gospel. And, and the question simply is this. It's a question that I think I'm coming to maybe have an answer in response to this very difficult question or very troubling question. Here's the question, simply put, do I really deserve hell? The Bible seems to tell me that because I'm a sinner, I deserve eternal misery in hell. At one level, that doesn't make any sense to my small mind. It just doesn't, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. And the reason it doesn't is probably a reason that if you think about the same question, you might respond the same way as me. Am I that bad? I mean, I went a little over the speed limit one time. I sometimes was a little unkind to my wife. I sometimes maybe told something that was, you know, kind of a little white lie, but I've really never done the big bad things. I've never killed anybody. Uh, I've never cheated the income tax people. Um, I've never been an adulterer. Uh, I really, I haven't done a lot of bad things. I, I grant you I'm a sinner, I failed, but does my failure really deserve eternal hell? Is there something within me that actually deserves that? And I ask questions like this, I've been asking all the time. I think about a, you know, a wonderful man like Billy Graham. Of course he was sinned, of course he knew the gospel, and of course he trusted Jesus as a savior. But if Billy Graham had never trusted Jesus as a savior, which of course he did, would he spend eternity in hell? How about Mother Teresa? She was a wonderful lady. Look what she did with her life. Did she fail here and there? Of course she was a failure. We all fail in some ways. But does any of our failure, does any of our sin really deserve what hell is going to be? We don't know what it's going to be thoroughly, obviously, but it's going to be miserable. Uh, you've heard me say before, maybe Fyodor, Fyodor Dostoevsky and the Brothers Karamazov, he was asked, the, the senior citizen in that particular novel, Father Zosima, was asked, what is hell? And his response was, hell is the suffering of being unable to love. Think about that. Relational beings, I bear the relational, relational image of the relational God of the Trinity, and therefore I was designed to be loved, I was designed to love, and in loving and being loved is my eternal joy. So that's going to be taken away from me, so I'm going to experience eternal misery, all because I've sinned? Well... I've been thinking about that question for a long time, and I really had no way to respond to it that satisfied me. But I think I, had a, I have an idea that's coming to my mind. And the answer is this. I began realizing what I suppose is obvious to all of us, but it's funny how the obvious sometimes becomes clear, that when did sin actually begin? When did it enter the, the universe? When did it enter existence? because it wasn't always there, because there was a time when there was nothing that was created. There was only God, the three-person community of the Father, Son, and Spirit. They were existing forever, ever, and ever. And of course, they never sinned. There was no sin in God. They're pure. They're holy. So when did sin enter the universe? And I suspect my mind normally over the years would go, well, I know the answer to that. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a forbidden tree. 
and they were cunningly induced to eat from that tree by, oh, by Satan. So Satan already existed. So maybe did sin begin with Satan as opposed to with Adam and Eve? And then as I started thinking about that, oh, well, wait a minute, sin didn't begin in the Garden of Eden. It was already there when God created the world and put Adam and Eve in a garden and said, I don't want you to eat from the forbidden tree. So my mind went back to thinking about this a little more carefully than I had before. And I went to two passages that you might be familiar with. There's a passage in um, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, and I'm looking at it right now as I get my Bible in front of me here. There's a passage in Ezekiel 28 where, where many commentators believe God is speaking not just to a local, a local leader, a local prince of, of, of a king of Tyre, but it looks like to many commentators, and I'm not a professional commentator, but I draw on commentators, and they believe that, that God is talking about Lucifer. And the word Lucifer in Latin, it actually means the morning star. It's a very high level word. God made this angel named Lucifer, and he was wonderful. He was beautiful. Listen to how God describes Lucifer in Ezekiel 28 and um, verse, uh, verse 12. Give him this message. Give the king of Tyre, I believe it's Lucifer, give Lucifer this message from the sovereign Lord. You, talking to Lucifer, you were the model of perfection. You were full of wisdom, exquisite in beauty. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. Then verse 14, God speaking, Lucifer, I ordained you and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian, a cherub among the cherubim, a very high ranking order of angels we learned in other parts of scripture. You had access to the holy mountain of God and you walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Sin began in eternity past with Lucifer. What sin did Lucifer commit? Why did an angel made so beautiful by God, exquisite in perfection, wise, access to the holy mountain of God, things that other angels weren't allowed to have? And he was given all this incredible uh, opportunities and attributes. And when I just pondered that, I kind of knew it before, but when I pondered it, I thought, God, did you know when you created Lucifer, he was going to become Satan? your arch enemy? Well, of course you did. I can't imagine you didn't. You're God, you know, the beginning from the end. So when you created Lucifer with all these incredible attributes, you knew he was going to turn into Satan. So why'd you do it? I don't understand. He has become so equipped now to be really the most effective enemy you could possibly have. Did God want to take Lucifer on and he became Satan? Well, let me give you a little side thought for the moment before I get back into what I'm really wanting to say. You know, there were two times in, in the story of, of our Lord when he was living here on earth, there were two times when pure evil, Satan, met pure goodness, Jesus. One was in the wilderness temptation before he began his ministry. Pure evil, Satan, came to tempt pure goodness, Jesus. Who won that round? Well, pretty simple. The Lord never loses what he doesn't choose to lose. And the second time that pure evil meant pure goodness was in the three hours of darkness from 12 to 3 on Calvary. Who won that battle? Well, Jesus, yet again, pure goodness always defeats pure evil. That's something I believe. That's a side thought, important thought, I think, but a side thought. And then go beyond that. Why did he sin? What was his sin? Well, let me give you my thought on that. And in order to get my thought on that, I've got to turn to Isaiah 14. Let me see if I can find it right away. I'm in Song of Songs now. Let me move ahead. Isaiah 14. Now we have uh, another record of God speaking to Satan. And he has several uh, sentences that God said he heard Satan say. Listen to the sentences that Satan said. They're radically different than the angel we met in Ezekiel 24, 28. Listen to what, he, what God said. God is talking to Lucifer, I believe. God is talking to Satan. 
And he says this, for you, Satan, said to yourself, I will, that's the important phrase, I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne above God's stars. And the, the, the phrase God's stars in other passages refers to other angels. So Lucifer is saying, now becoming Satan, I'm going to ascend to heaven, to a place where I don't belong, only God belongs, and I'm going to set my throne, I will set my throne above the, all the other angels. I will, third sentence, I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. And there are some who believe far on the way in the north is where Babylon believed that their various gods were. So again, Satan is saying, I want to assume the place of God. I want to be the most important guy in the entire universe. That's my plan. The next verse, verse 14, Isaiah 14, I will climb to the highest heavens. And here's the last phrase, I will be like the most high. Did you ever stop and just ponder that? How did sin enter the universe? What was the sin? Well, it started with Lucifer, obviously. But what exactly was the sin? I will be like the most high summarizes those five I will sentences. Why did that happen? How did that happen? Well, let me use a little bit of speculative imagination. I can't give you a verse for this, but I think it makes reasonable sense given the verses that we do have and what we've learned so quickly already from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. It seems clear to me that Lucifer was given a very prominent place. And because he was beautiful in all his ways, wise, access to God in direct ways that other angels apparently didn't have. And I would suspect that because he was this special angel, that the other angels, maybe millions of them, would look at Lucifer with great awe and with great respect. And there was nothing wrong in doing that. If I had a chance to meet C.S. Lewis, which I never have had, but I will someday, I would look at C.S. Lewis with incredible respect for his brain, for his kindness, for his generosity, for his thinking, for his books, obviously, for his sermons. And I would look at with him great respect. And I would think that a guy like C.S. Lewis would respond very appropriately by saying, oh, Larry, don't glorify me. God has given me certain gifts and certain talents. And all I want to do is sing the song to God be the glory, great things he has done. It's wonderful to be to be respected for whatever talents you had. I had one chance in my life to meet Billy Graham, and it was quite a thrill to meet a man so anointed by God, and he was so humble. There was no sense of, well, Larry, you realize really I'm something. There was nothing like that. It was just gratitude to God for how Billy has been anointed, and I'm willing to assume that Lucifer, before he said all these terrible I will sentences, was able to say, yes, God has been so gracious to me. I'm so so grateful. Yes, I know that I have so much from God. Isn't he wonderful to give me this? But then I wonder, did the angel's gaze shift from Lucifer to God? Because only God was in every way supreme, superior, more beautiful, more wonderful than Lucifer. Is it possible? Is it conceivable? Here's my speculative thought that when the gaze shifted away from Lucifer, to God, that Lucifer felt something. Some of the esteem that I've enjoyed has been removed. I'd like to get it back. And I wonder if at that point, he said something like this, there is a greater good available to me than simply being respected as second class to God. I would like to have that gaze not shift from me. Is that the beginning of sin in the universe? And I'm suspecting that it is. I'm suspecting it's the beginning of sin. And let me tell you more precisely what I think I'm talking about. Now, I'm not it's totally clear on all this, but it's speculative and I think maybe important. <sighs> Do we really question in every moment of our lives that our good God is always doing us good. Our God is good. We know that. We know Jeremiah 31 is at 23, somewhere in there, 31 maybe. In Jeremiah 31, God says, I'm always doing you good. I'm not capable of doing you bad. Lucifer, I did you complete good in giving you what you have. And now you're telling me that there's a greater good than what I give you and I'm going to pursue it. What would be the greater good? Well, 
I think it follows pretty logically and naturally, the greater good is deciding what is my greatest good at any given moment. And Lucifer decided his greatest good when he became Satan, his greatest good at any given moment was having something that God did not give him. I want you to ponder that. I also believe it follows, and we're gonna see this in the Garden of Eden in just a few minutes, that Lucifer was also deciding for himself what was the greatest evil. Now think about that. Here's Lucifer wants to be like God. Well, he was obviously limited. How can a created being become an uncreated being? Well, that's not possible. Lucifer wasn't stupid, we know that. So he wasn't gonna become an uncreated being. Did he think he could become sovereign? I would suspect no. There's a lot of attributes of God that Lucifer knew he could not grab. He couldn't grab omnipresence. He's one spirit being who can take a form, apparently. He's, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. There's so much about God that he could never, never be. But maybe the one thing he could do was decide what was his greatest good. The greatest good was being number one. That I committed this world determined to be number one. Is narcissism an epidemic, not in the psychological world, but in the human world? Is there something inside of me that says, you know, the greatest good at this particular moment is not having certain things go wrong. The greatest good is having certain things go right in my life. Let me give you what's maybe a sort of a silly illustration, but it doesn't seem silly to me, but it makes my point. So bear with me as I struggle through a, uh, the illustration really about a, about a month ago, actually, quite recently. And the illustration is this. I'm not a good sleeper. Sometimes I'm a good sleeper, sometimes I'm not. And I've not been sleeping well for a while. But about a month ago, it was two in the morning. I was wide awake. And I don't mean to be unkind to my wonderful wife. She's not unkind to me. I don't want to be unkind to her. But that night, she did not wear her anti-snoring device. Now, stay with me. Silly illustration, but it makes the point. Now, I'm lying in bed, looked at the clock. It's 2 a.m., wide awake, not even close to sleep. My wife is snoring. What was my greatest good at that moment? What would come naturally to me? Not with deep theological thought, not with prayer and reflection, but just what would kind of rise up in me at a moment like that? And it became very, very clear to me um, that what I really wanted to do was to reach over and poke my wife and maybe turn her head a little bit, maybe change her posture in my bed next to me. And then she would stop snoring, it's happened before. I really wasn't interested in her ability to sleep and she was sleeping very nicely. I was far more interested in what I perceived uh, automatically, reflexively, was my greatest good, that I sleep. I get a better opportunity to sleep with Rachel no longer snoring, maybe grabbing an Ambien, popping it in my mouth and going to sleep so I can wake up in the morning and get to work with some energy. That obviously was my greatest good at the moment. And because I was thinking about the, the passage in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, and about this original sin of my making a decision on my own, what is my greatest good, and really asking God to cooperate with my greatest good, because he wasn't giving me my greatest good in that moment, and that would deserve persistent prayer, so God would let me go to sleep. And I found myself just thinking, this is what I ought to do, I'm going to pray about it, I've got to get my greatest good, and then it hit me, kind of all of a sudden, thanks to my time in Ezekiel and Isaiah, and I thought, well, wait a minute, I think, and can I say a very harsh phrase that will sound maybe badly overdone? I don't think it is. But in that moment, I really believe the Spirit convicted me. I wasn't asking for conviction. He's just on duty when he chooses to be in his own time and way. But I found myself saying, right now, at two in the morning, angry at my inability to sleep, wishing my wife would stop snoring, my greatest good was sleep, I found myself convicted by saying, right now, I'm living like a disciple of Satan, not a disciple of Jesus. And that thought just grabbed me. And I thought, I, I don't want to do that. You know, Paul tells us, don't be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I'm a lover of God. Then I believe he always has my greatest good in his mind. And he's always doing me his greatest good. And when I was convicted of that, I thought, I'm not going to reach over and poke my wife. My greatest good is staying faithful to God and accepting my sleeplessness. Not that I like it, because I don't. I wish I was asleep. But accepting my sleeplessness 
and this will sound a little strange, as an opportunity to remain faithful to God and to trust him for whatever good he might be doing, that maybe I could persevere my way through the sleeplessness without getting upset, without getting angry, still disappointed. And, and I thought about that. And, and I, I thought too about something else that fits in with this. So let me stray over to a different direction. I thought it was gonna be unscripted. This is kind of where my mind is going right now. I did a Bible series in Jeremiah some time ago. I think I did it on the web, I'm not sure. I did it at the Cove what, some time ago, the Billy Graham Training Center. And the thought that occurred to me was, did God provide Jeremiah with his greatest good? Sure didn't look like it. 40 years of faithful ministry, 40 years of preaching the message God gave him to preach, no visible response from anybody in Judah. But 11, uh, chapter 11 of Isaiah 50, uh, uh, the book of Isaiah 55, chapter 11, God says there that whenever I send my word out, it will do what I intend, which has to be God's understanding of the greatest good. And I began to wonder about that. Here we have Jeremiah faithfully preaching the word of God, God saying, when my word is preached, it does what I intend it to do, the greatest good. What was the greatest good in Jeremiah's life? Well, it wasn't what he perceived was the greatest good. His greatest good, I would think in his soul at some level would be a response to some people to repent of their sin, which Jeremiah was saying, repent or you're gonna be destroyed. And the greatest good would be, I don't want Jerusalem destroyed. I don't want Judah destroyed. I want my people to be holy and to be godly. And that's my greatest good as I preach. But it wasn't God's greatest good for Jeremiah, apparently, because he never got any results. And so my conclusion when I was preaching on this, and I'm just thinking about it right now, is that the greatest good that God was providing Jeremiah was the opportunity to not quit when discouraged. Could I not quit on trusting God at two in the morning, even though I'm discouraged and wishing I were able to be asleep? That I believe was the sin that entered the world, to decide for myself what is my greatest good and to decide for myself what is my greatest evil, and then to live to pursue my greatest good, to pray about my greatest good, and to live to avoid my greatest evil. So if I'm in a relationship or somebody is mistreating me, I'll back away from them. That's my greatest evil, to be mistreated. I don't want to do that. My greatest good is to get what I want out of people. So when I counsel with people, I'm going to be trying to be very clever and people were going to say, oh, Dr. Crabb, you really have a good insight there. And I'm going to say, yeah, I was, I kind of do that. Me and God were a team, you know, my greatest good is, is impressing you with how wonderful I can counsel or whatever book I can write that you might like. And it's like, no, 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 no. My greatest good is very different. But then when the sin enter humanity, well, Satan determined to live for himself and to gain the greatest good of being equal with God and to build a kingdom, a kingdom of evil, that he would seduce the entire world into wanting, blinding our eyes to the greatest good that God provides, something like love, baby, forgiveness, hope of heaven, so we can wait for eternal joy. Those blessings are spiritually blessed, spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but no, 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 no. I want to create a kingdom where people look at me and don't turn their gaze away from me to God. How's that working for the devil? Well, he's the prince of the power of the air working quite well. Got a whole lot of followers, a whole lot of disciples of Satan who have no interest in becoming disciples of Jesus. When did that start? Well, it started in humanity in the Garden of Eden. Now think about that with me for a minute. Here's Adam and Eve. They're enjoying um, incredible blessings. I mean, earthly blessings. They're enjoying Eden. It's called paradise. It's a wonderful place to be, apparently. We were never there, of course, in its innocent state. But Adam and Eve were there, and they were innocent. And again, with my speculative imagination, I can kind of dream a little bit and visualize that the two of them are walking around the garden, having a great time, enjoying their marriage in every possible way, enjoying the beauty of everything, enjoying animals that were not dangerous, enjoying lions that were cuddly, no doubt. Everything was just perfect. Everything was wonderful. Satan comes along and he says uh, to Eve, did God tell you something about that you shouldn't do? Uh, what did God say about that? There's that tree over there. What's it look like to you, Eve? And I wonder, had even Adam been walking around, you know, God gave instructions to Adam before Eve was created about all that they could enjoy and what they were told not to enjoy, the one particular tree. And um, was there anything that God hadn't given them 
Satan came along and was implying, you know, there's something better that's available to you than you already have. That tree does look good. And I imagine that when they were walking around the garden that Eve maybe said to Adam, Adam, I know you told me that God told us we shouldn't eat from that tree, but look at the fruit. That's really a ripe apple or a ripe banana or a ripe pear or a ripe peach, whatever it was. And it looks delicious and we're not supposed to have that. Does that make any sense to you, Adam? And I wonder if Adam said, I haven't thought about it, but as I'm thinking about it now, no, it doesn't make much sense. I don't know what to do about that. But God made it very clear that in the day we eat from it, we're gonna surely die. And we're, we're allowed to eat every fruit in the garden, no limits at all except one. And, um, and if we just live like that, we're gonna be doing just fine. But if we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's gonna be a terrible consequence. But no, I don't get it either, Eve, I don't know. Another side thought, well, maybe not a side thought, but an important thought. Was Satan onto something when he said, God hasn't given you all of what he could give you? My answer is yes. But what had God not given Adam and Eve in their innocent state that was something wonderful from God that he eventually did give? And the answer is grace, forgiveness. There was no need to supply Adam and Eve with forgiveness, with grace forgiveness, because they were innocent, they hadn't sinned. And was there something that developed in their minds? I wouldn't call it a, I wouldn't call it a disappointment. I'd call it kind of a vague sense of, is something missing? I don't think they were disappointed in some, well, gee, it gotta be nicer to us, we'd be doing a lot better. I, I don't think it was that at all. I could be wrong, I'm speculating here. But I think there was some sense of, is there something in an image bearer that would love to know all of God? Psalm 73, nearness to God is my only good. I desire nothing on earth but only to be with you. That's at the end of Psalm 73 by Asaph. And I wonder if Adam and Eve were just kind of, Eve in particular, was thinking, Adam as well, that there's something that's not quite missed, that's not quite here. And, and of course, you know, the whole temptation where Eve got all mixed up in what she was saying. But what did they do? What were they tempted to do? And cunningly by Satan, well, the answer is they were tempted to take from God his rightful prerogative to decide what is the greatest good in existence. And the greatest good in existence right now in my life is not being rid of my cancer. And I have a, now a foot disease that just came on me about four or five weeks ago. That doesn't feel like my greatest good. Is God giving me his greatest good? Or do I sometimes wonder if he really is? Is that what happened with Adam and Eve? And they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and took for themselves a prerogative that belongs only to God. And I think that's the essence of sin. And when I think about that, my mind goes back to my original question, do I deserve hell? Well, I don't think I do deserve hell. Maybe I'm wrong but I don't think I do deserve hell for the little sins that I've committed. But I do believe, and let me explain what I mean by this, that I do deserve to be away from God forever, which is hell. I do deserve to be away from God because I've told him I'm not interested in what he wants to give me. I do deserve to be away from God for eternity because I've committed the one sin that everyone has committed. Al Capone has committed it. Hugh Hefner has committed it. Billy Graham has committed it. Mother Teresa has committed it. I've committed it. The best preacher in the world has committed it. The worst sinner in the world has committed it. We've all committed one basic sin that is worthy of eternal condemnation. And can I put it in kind of a, I don't know, a flip way that might make it lose its power? Have I just told God to take a hike? Have I told God, here's my plan for life? <sighs> I believe I have. And I think about Dorothy Stairs, a contemporary of C.S. Lewis, a wonderfully bright woman who talked about a lot of things. And she said, if you want your own way, God will let it, uh, if you want your own way, God will let you have it. Hell is the enjoyment of your own way forever, which is misery. Now, my burden is pretty much that. My burden is that I've committed that one sin. And I'm really aware 
that when I look at, in a mirror, obviously, but when I look at, at people generally, a, a lot of them just seem like really good people. Christians sometimes feel like really good people. People that maybe have fallen into the disease that I call premature contentment. I really am leading a good life. I love my wife, I love my husband, I love my kids, I love my friends, I give generously to church. I don't miss church on Sunday. I have my devotions every morning. I witness to my neighbors. I'm really a good person. And I wonder if our understanding of sin is so weak because we haven't seen the ultimate sin to determine for ourselves what is our greatest good that we really haven't come to appreciate the cross. Because if the cross just takes care of my obvious minor sins, I feel reasonably grateful. But if the cross takes care of the most wicked sin that I could think of ever committing, telling God, I'm really smarter than you. I really know what is best for me and I expect you to cooperate. So let's live life on my terms. And when I'm there, I become a follower, a disciple of Satan. And that's a real problem. It's the one sin that everybody commits and until we see that sin, and because I've been seeing it more recently, whether it's two o'clock in the morning or a dozen other ways, um, you know, my foot disease now is driving me nuts. I, I, I wobble when I walk. And I just find myself saying, God, haven't I gone through enough suffering for you to refine me a little bit more? And I think his response is, Larry, you're moving along. You're my son. I love you. You're my boy. I'm, I'm all for you. I, I'm going to be with you. I'm coming for you. I'm, you're my kid. Everything's great. But I do want you to know that there's still a flesh spirit battle going on with you and the essence of your flesh, as J.I. Packer, Packer calls it, an anti-God virus. I don't wanna go along with your understanding of my greatest good. My greatest good doesn't seem to me to be having ongoing cancer. My greatest good doesn't seem to me to be having a foot disease. My greatest good doesn't seem to be a lot of things, sleeplessness, sleeplessness. I, I've got a lot of understandings of greatest good that are just plain wrong. And I want to acknowledge that and the degree to which I, I can see what I'm doing, kind of flipping God off and taking a privilege that he only has, a right that he only has, and making it mine, that makes me value the cross all the more. And then it makes me value the resurrection all the more. Resurrection power, what does that mean? Could I really enter the battle between the flesh and the spirit in new ways and come to understand, no, at any given moment, I believe he's doing me the greatest good. He's drawing me into nearness to himself. He's drawing me into faithfulness to him. He's drawing me into depending on him, not my health for joy, depending on him, not my money for joy, depending on him, not my book sales for joy, depending on him, not give how things go on my ministry for joy. No, I want to depend on knowing him. As some of you know, I've said it before that the word for joy translated in the New Testament is shara, C-H-A-R-A. -A, and it's a word that means dependent on joy completely for God's character, for his goodness that knows how to define good. Here's my final thought. Real obvious, I'm being redundant here, but I hope it's big a sense to you. There's never a moment in my life, no matter how difficult it might be, there's never a dark night in my soul that might seem so dark I can barely carry it. There's never a moment when pain is in my life, when it's unbearable. There's never a moment when a relationship has broken into shreds and my heart is hurting and I'm feeling mistreated. There's never a moment in my life when God is not doing me the greatest good, drawing me into himself, whether unfelt or whether simply trusted by faith so that I can persevere through my life knowing he is doing me good. The one sin we all commit is deciding what's my greatest good and what is my greatest evil and living to get my greatest good and living to avoid my greatest evil as opposed to living to celebrate the goodness of God in my life at any difficult or wonderful moment. Folks, that's my question. Do I deserve hell without Jesus Christ's death? I do. With his death, I don't deserve heaven, but that's where I'm going. And I'm waiting for it until it's mine to fully enjoy forever and ever and ever. And then I will never say to God, you never failed me in giving me my greatest good. I can say it now by faith. I'll say it by sight, then, not now. Thanks for listening. Thanks for unpacking that. It's interesting, Dad, when you first talked to us about this, uh, you used a third example. First, obviously, was Lucifer in heaven. Um, the second was, was then Adam and Eve 
in the garden. And the third was then Jesus standing in front of Caiaphas. Ah, uh, yeah. Where, where Caiaphas says to says to Christ, um, you've been accused of a lot of different things, but this is what I'm most interested in. Yeah. You, know, you say that you're God, you know, that that's the one sin that I cannot overlook or whatever Caiaphas was thinking. I don't know. But but then God says, when he says, do you claim to be God? And Christ said, I am. And that's yeah. when Caiaphas ripped the robes. And, you know, and so then that was actually the, the, the sin, which of course wasn't sin because he is God, was God, um, that he was sent to the cross for. You started to unpack that a little bit too, which I think just... Uh, and that's really important, Kev. Let me just say a word about that because he was committed of other things too. He was he was judged for other things. Jesus was for I'm going to tear down the temple. Well, oh, you can't do that, and right. and arranged it so that though Jesus would be punished for the one sin that Lucifer committed and the one sin that we all committed for claiming to be God, which of course is an absurdity because he was God, as you just pointed out. But he was condemned for the one sin that each of us have committed. That Jesus, of course, did not commit, but Caiaphas thought he did. That's a very important point. I forgot that. That's good. Great to add to it. That was your third illustration, which I thought really brought it home. And so there's a couple of questions before we go, Dad, that I'd love to just, uh, you and I chatted this morning over breakfast about this one. Someone um, wrote in about this question, um, and um, it really talks about the dissatisfaction with what God has given. It, it is dissatisfaction with what God has given the same as what is my greatest good, or how are they different? Oh, I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, dissatisfaction. I think that all of us, to some degree, are going to sense some awareness that there's a good we want that God is not giving us. And we're then in danger of living out our wrong definition of what is our greatest good. Um, I think I have a hesitation um, using the word disappointed too strongly, um, but I know they're dissatisfied. Are, yeah, dissatisfied. I'm sorry, dissatisfied. Um, you know, there's an old hymn, "Satisfied with the Lord Jesus, I am blessed." And there are times that, in my immaturity, and it's only in my immaturity, that I feel like I mean, even even this this morning, I, I found myself praying. You know, we're, we your your wife's cancer and and my cancer, and I was saying, Lord. You know, I, I can't help but slip it out. Would you heal her? Would you heal me? I really would like that a lot. And I don't want to. I don't want it to become a demand uh, at all. But I do find myself just letting that prayer come out as a request. But then I have to put a comma and say, "But if you don't, you're still doing me my greatest good." But I got to think about what that is right now. It doesn't come automatically to my immature soul. Um, so I don't know if I'm responding to the question very well, but but I think it's true that there are times I feel just a certain level of disappointment with God, and then I have to realize, no, Larry, you're you're just off base. You're 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 off off track. As my new book's talking about off track to the life that God has for me, and then I sometimes settle down. And let me just say, for the last month, I've been um, unasked for. I've been in a place of incredible spiritual rhythm. I've had just a wonderful time writing something, preparing for a next step SSD that I'm doing in a little bit, and just thinking about what it means to get all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places, which I think is my understanding of the greatest good that God gives me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've really seen that, Dad, just that we've had an opportunity to spend the last week together, and you've, <clears throat> you can't quit writing. Feels great. It's amazing. I can't wait to dive into it. I, I'm not as fast. I can't keep up with you. With everything you're doing here. Let me ask you a few more questions before we wrap this day up here. Is there a chance that the final judgment is determined by a, a system of grading on the on the curve? <laughs> I think yeah. I know you'll answer this question. If so, uh, would it help to get other people to do some bad things, or would that be bad? Help to get other people to do bad things? If if they're graded, yeah. <laughs> if they're, if judgment is graded on a curve, and I, I yeah, I, I actually remember you you talking about this years ago at some level. I don't know. I don't know how you want to respond to that. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, are we graded on a curve? You know, you're a little bit above my pay grade here. Um, so the, there's, there's a verse in the end of Genesis 18, I think it says, shall the judge of all the earth do right? I kind of say that at an exclamation point. Am I going to be judged? Yeah, the, the Bema is going to be the judgment seat of Christ for all believers. And yeah, I'm going to be judged for what I've done in my life. 
um, I'm going to be totally forgiven, but my rewards are going to depend on the judgment. So in that sense, I wouldn't be surprised if there's grading on a curve. Exactly what that means is going to be in God's hands, not mine. Um, but I look at the Bama, the, the Bama judgment seat, and there's times I find myself, I wish it were more often, when I'm annoyed with somebody and I want to just kind of snap at them a little bit, uh, relational sin, which all this is relational sin we're talking about. Um, and I feel like, you know, I don't think I want to commit that sin. I don't want to be judged for this when I get to the Bema. And there's times I repent with anticipation of the Bema. So that's not a bad thing to do. But the idea of encouraging other people to sin more so they get judged more heavily, I don't think that's in the interest of love. Which, which elevates you. Yeah, that's probably not the... Yeah, that's that's God's problem. I'm not, I'm not here to make people's lives worse. Yeah. Can you talk more about how the desire to have another's, another's gaze or be special like Lucifer was, works in our closest relationship. Is it wrong to want something else to think I am special or important? I think that's where the word pride- Someone comes. else, I'm sorry. That's where the pride comes in, the greatest of all sin. Let me give you another corny illustration. It's gonna sound a little bit trivial, but at the time it wasn't. Your mother and I were on our honeymoon 54 years ago, and I had saved all my money and we were in Bermuda. And the waiter in our restaurant was a very nice looking 25 year old European man with very lovely dark hair. And he took a shine to my wife. And he said to her, would you like me to teach you how to surf? And I was instantly annoyed because her gaze went from me to this European good looking guy. Now, is that a trivial illustration? At the time, it was not trivial at all. And when a gaze shifts from me, something happens and i'm saying right now my greatest good is not being realized i want rachel this pretty young girl to look at me with utter fascination and when she wasn't my greatest good was not being served now i can take that into a thousand other illustrations that are far more significant than that for example i can tell you that i was at a, a book conference a number of years ago and philip yancey who's i think a, the premier writer in america i really do he's a marvelous wordsmith and he's a good friend um, one of his books was up for book of the year. My book was up for good of the year. And the announcement came and I was sitting next to Philip and the spotlight went on Philip. It did not go on me. What happened to me inside? Was there disappointment? Yeah, there was. Was there a little sense of, I wish I'd have had that. That would have been a greater good. I would have enjoyed having my book be book of the year. It wasn't. And that just shows how that little sin just shows up in all kinds of ways number of other illustrations, that's just two to make the point. Does every sin, big or small, originate from the same attitude? Therefore, the lifestyle of small or big sins originating from that bigger sin? I think that's a brilliant comment. I really do. When I think about all the sins, I think about the sins that so many people commit adultery, pornography, and all the obvious big ones, you know, and all the bad things that pe people do, and all the little tiny things that we do, whether they're getting jealous of Philip or something like that, all the little sins that we commit, I really think come out from the same passionate sin, the same passionate sinful energy that is locked in my soul, and my flesh is never going to be cured. That is the energy of my soul. I want what I define as my greatest good in this moment. And that leads me into, hey, I'm really hurting right now. I feel lost. I don't feel like I can sleep. Maybe a little bit of porn would help me go to sleep. Come on, why not? That's going to be my greatest good for the moment. Yeah, you know, uh, this, this, this friend of mine is really irritating me. Uh, he, wants to, he, he wants to make a phone call with me. I don't want to talk to him. He's just driving me nuts. And so my greatest good is not talking to him for crying out loud. My greatest evil would be talking to him. So I'm not going to talk to him. I'm going to just hang up the phone, not answer his phone when he calls. I think that the core energy behind all of our little sins and big sins is our decision to determine our greatest good for ourselves. I've got one more question that I think you'll find is interesting. Um, so did Satan do Adam and Eve a favor by opening more of God to them, i.e. the redemptive grace? <laughs> I'm not sure if Satan ever wanted to do God a favor. Let's assume that for the starting point. But what I would say do is- Do Adam and Eve a favor even in giving yeah. more of God to them. I would say this. I would say that God always defeats Satan for his purpose. Satan never wins a battle that God takes on. He allows Satan to do a lot of things like the Job story. He allowed Satan to mess up Job's life, of course. 
But look at the look at the favor that God did for Job by bringing him at the end of the book to saying, I only knew about you before. Now I know you. I've seen you. I know who you are. Satan can never thwart the purposes of God's eternal plan. And I think that's really, really important to say. So I think God orchestrated the whole thing. He knew Satan was going to be his arch enemy. He knew Satan was going to tempt Adam and Eve. And he knew that he was going to be thwarted by giving Satan the opportunity to, to get them involved in a sin that would open God for the opportunity to demonstrate his unbelievable love by dying on the cross. You get that in Narnia all over the place. You know, Satan thinks he's won because he shaved Aslan's hair and has him killed. And that's not the case. And after the death, he goes back, he stands up and Satan is totally defeated. And I think one of my favorite parts of Narnia is when, when God says to the, the, the Pevensies, is that their name, the four kids? He says, let's go get the white witch. You know, we're going to win this one, folks. Pure evil cannot stand against pure goodness. So everything that happens is going to be a demonstration of pure goodness defeating pure evil. And Satan was not a willing participant in that process. At that point, I think he was deceived by his hatred by God, uh, his hatred of God, when he was when he was getting Adam and Eve in a, in a mess. He thought he was winning. He was never winning. He's never going. Uh, we've got time for one more question. This is an interesting one here. Uh, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. Jesus promised us trouble. Yeah. And groaning and travailing. This is in Romans. Yep. So how is it wrong to acknowledge and let ourselves feel the reality of it? When does our longing and groaning become dissatisfaction with God's best? Groaning becomes dissatisfaction with God. This groaning becomes dissatisfaction with God's best when you lose hope of heaven. When all you're thinking about is your life lived between your birth and your death, if that's all you're thinking about, I wouldn't know how to handle groaning well. My groaning would be irrit irritability. My groaning would be, God, what are you doing? I'm not all that thrilled with you right now. But if I live my life between the cross, in the resurrection, and in the coming, if I live waiting for heaven, knowing what's possible, that only Jesus makes available, and knowing resurrection power, that actually let me accept the goodness of God when I don't feel it, then groaning becomes an opportunity to wait for heaven. Failure becomes an opportunity to enjoy forgiveness. Misery becomes an opportunity to know joy is on its way, but only when you live in between the cross and the coming. And as I anticipated, this topic does generate a bunch of questions and a bunch of comments. And so we've got one more that I think we've got time for, Dad, and I'd love to, to hear your answer to this is, how do we move with strength and confidence in how God created us and gifted us without falling into pride? How do we live humbly? I never have. <laughs> okay. What I mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a book by Andrew Murray called Humility, and he's arguing that there's from the, one of the scriptures in Matthew 11, 20, 28, whatever it is, where Jesus gives us an indication of what his heart really is. And his heart is a gentle, humble heart. And if I'm going to be like Jesus, there's got to be humility. But that's the battle. Um, even after I was writing today, I came up with a really good thought. And it felt really, really good. And I immediately said, Lord, I'm kind of impressed with myself right now. And I, I don't know if we can ever get away from pride sneaking into our soul. But the point, uh, the point here is, what is my ruling passion? Not what is my every passion, because there's going to be pride, there's going to be jealousy, there's going to be all kind of stuff going on in my unglorified soul, not yet sanctified soul. But what, what passion rules within me? And even as I was writing and thought, ooh, that's really good. I, I got a good idea here. And I was feeling a little bit proud. I said, Lord, can you just handle this with me? Because I'm, I'm a jerk right now. I'm so full of pride. I want to just be forgiven. And then my ruling passion was, I really would like to give this to other people because I think it is something from the Lord. And I don't deserve it, but I've been given it, and I'm grateful for it. But the pride still sneaks in a little bit. So never expect to have a pure motive in your life until you see Jesus. Then you'll be the way you want to be because you're going to see him face to face, not until. Continue the struggle. The battle will be there until we die. <laughs>